in there and actually put in the, um, the links that are necessary for it. So it shows the north side, east side, west side, and south side, and what their resources are. All of the um, sides have a link that you could go into and just link in that way. And then it, there are also in the top bar. So if you go to the north side page, it will look like this. Um, it would have all of the resources necessary for food pantries, the food bank information. You could click into the food bank and actually get to their website. You could go to Food Finder and be able to get to that site and actually um, look for different pantries in different areas within that site of the food pantry. Um, I still need to get in touch with food bank themselves so I can link up their flyers for the fresh food distribution and the mobile distribution. That way they could actually get to it in that way. And then the food banks would be, their icons will be on there when you get to them, it will send you to their site and all of their like Facebook and other links are also there. So you could hook up with those links also. Um, that way you could find other resources besides just food pantries. So right now I'm just working on the code on how it will look. That way, when I get all of the information for the pantries, I could actually link them all in to each one of the um, pantries themselves. Awesome. Any roadblocks? So my roadblocks right now will be me trying to research these food pantries. I've been looking online and every time I try to build the page for the north side or the west side or the south side, I end up going into those places and either the places are closed, it's not updated, they don't have websites, they don't have information, they don't have hours, they don't have any of the information that I need. So I need to go a step further and actually get in touch with these pantries um, face to face and get the proper information to actually link into my page and to get everything working. Cool. Um, I might, may I suggest also that <clears throat> you can also contact the city because they might have up to dated list of um, some of these food pantries. And I'm sorry, um, I know that downtown Syracuse is a site in its own mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. It doesn't fall between those. Yes, yes. So that's, um, and there there are a lot of yep. food pantries there yeah. too. There's also like Northeast, Southeast yeah. uh, and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm kind of putting those within the North or the East side mm -hmm. in both of them. That way they could be researched by both sides. I know there's also that they actually do buy certain maps that certain streets are not serviced by cer cer certain areas and stuff like that. So doing the research itself is what's gonna take me the most. That's why I wanna get my code itself done because once it comes down to the research and actually getting out there and doing the research, that's gonna be most of the time that I need to spend. So you've got um, a lot done on the code side. Um, so don't be afraid to kind of slow it down and focus on like getting the site to where you want the site to be. Yep. Um, because you are a full capstone check-in ahead of where you need to be, you know, yep. right? So um, yeah, and I also did uh, the contact form, which is something that really took me some time to do and to be able to do the contact form and the new pantry request. If a pantry is not in my system, they could request to be put into the pantry. And then also uh, sign up and create form if they want to actually update the information themselves within the pantry. Beautiful. Good job. Awesome progress. Yeah. Can I? I just want to say that she. This is great. This is wonderful. I I love how it looks and it's great. And you're probably gonna have to go to the pantries themselves because sometimes uh, they put hours up and they're not there. And it's not because they don't mean to be there or whatever, but because they are short staffed. 
Um, yeah, right now I actually, um, I the only one that I have that's fully active is that SNCC one in on the top of the north side page, because yeah. I know for a fact that that's their hours, that's their information, that's their real Facebook, and everything like that. It's going to be a lot harder to find the information for other places, so I need to get in touch with like Peace Inc. because I know they have a lot of pantries in the different areas of Syracuse. I have to get in touch with. Um, um, maybe like the South Side um, Community Center, which they have a pantry and they have uh, resources to other pantries and stuff like that. So um, I'm trying to get the site looking how I want it to look. That way, if I do have to go out and do the research, which takes a lot of time and yeah. a lot of face to face interaction, I don't fall behind on the other stuff. Yeah, you yeah. are an entire checking ahead there. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about the pacing. Um, and then once we get into those React modules, there will be a lot more to cover there in terms of how to kind of move all the existing site functionality into React, um, which is definitely a task on its own, but like pace yourselves, like you're already way ahead. So focus on what you want to focus on. And remember that um, while a fully functional site is great for graduation, it doesn't need to be fully complete, right? So come graduation, if there's still pantries that you're not getting in touch with or whatever, like you can put in dummy information for that, right? And when you publish it online, you can always just like hide a couple of that and, and kind of go from there. That's what I have right now. I have the pages done, but I have placeholders with the links there. That way, if I do find the pantry, then I could just snap in the information real quick. So I just wanted to have the space for it, yeah. but I just have placeholders for them. Perfect. Also, um, it on. We can't spend this sorry, Catholic Charities. Summer. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I, oh boy. Okay. Sorry. So I really haven't had that much of, um, of a success like Alba, but I do want to share my <laughs> capstone. Uh, not my capstone. <laughs> my yeah my wireframe um so geez okay so I pretty much this is kind of like my layout um this is my first page this is uh my home page um this is my drop down button um you can search up anything here create an account sign in um I also have another way instead of the drop down. I have a sign in page here, create an account. Um, this is my create your account page that I'm going to be also building um, and inquiring more information so they can answer questions that I'll put into this. This is pretty much just the capstone itself. Um, so my <clears throat> my project, which I didn't even tell you what it is, is I wanted to build a page where college graduate students can go um, in search of schools within the standardized test that they take, whether it be GRE, MCAT, LSAT, um, GMAT, so whatever score they get, they have, and um, and whatever their grade point average is, they can put it in. Um, they can put their grade point average and their test scores. And then based off of the filters that we I have here, they can search up for the schools and they will get, I'm thinking the top five schools that um, they will most likely be um, accepted into. Um, I know that I spoke to Jason and, uh, not Jason, not Jason. Um, I spoke to Nate and he said that this is a good API program. So um that's kind of like something that I'm also going to probably need help and assistance with. But so far, this is what I have um, my, for this upcoming month. Obviously, it is to do the coding for all of these pages that I have here. There's about, I think, like 13 of them. <laughs> I may way too many. But um, so, yeah, so that's that's pretty much my capstone idea. OK, thank you. Why you can never look at a man for anything. <laughs> it's literally sitting right in front of the We're already halfway there. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, so my capstone idea is um based around gardening. 
I, um, I, I unfortunately don't have my uh, wireframe in Figma. I just kind of wrote it out. But um, basically the idea is to have a tool that aids like first time gardeners or people who are inexperienced with that kind of a combination of information database and a social media aspect. So, you know, you'll be able to track your progress and be like, oh, hey, look at my turnips are finally growing. And then um, if any, if anyone, you know, happens to have any like tips or information on, you know, if they're not growing big enough or they, you know, would are not faring well in a certain spot or whatever, um, you can have people comment and kind of share information that way. Um, let me see here. All right, so this was just kind of, I mean, uh, it's probably gonna be hard to see. Uh, so yeah, that would be like the idea of the uh, homepage there. Um, we would have like the nav bar in the middle Oops. Um, with the uh, different tabs. And in the background, I was thinking of just like having like a, uh, you know, scrolling images of either, well, I mean, initially it's just gonna be stock photos, but I'm hoping like over time, like if it gets to be um, more populated, we could just like have, like user made images and things like that. Um, and then the second page was kind of just like an about me section um, that would list uh, goals and um, upcoming updates, as well as, um, you know, the email uh, and data fields, a sitemap, and then a link to like my personal websites or the company websites uh, for like Twitter or things like that if you wanted to follow updates from there. Um, and then see here, here would be like an example of the, uh, journal or progress page layout. Um, so the images would be in the X box square to the left or right. And then on the opposite side, you would have like the date and a short blurb about whatever you'd want to add or any questions that you may have. I'm going the wrong way. And then um, this was another aspect um, idea I was playing around with, kind of like a plotter uh, grid. So you could um, essentially like plot out the um, different plots that you have in mind, um, select whichever seeds or plants, crops that you wanted to add in, check off if it's been watered or uh, compost added, things like that. Um, and then I also am uh, thinking about eventually adding like a kind of like a guide section, almost like a mini Wikipedia type thing where um, you could look up plants or crops that would do well in your region. And then from that, you could, um, you know, go to your personal uh, plot planner and then, you know, arrange things from there and keep it updated as the season goes. Yeah, so make sure you're you're starting to think through kind of like um like I know you've got like your journal plan page planned out, but make sure you've got it planned out to be like how do I add a new plan? What's the login screen look like? All of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're you're on the right track now. It's like, hey, do I feel like I've got this out of my head enough to start working on it and building it? And if you do, great, move on from wireframes, like dive into your code, start building those pages. Yeah. If not, spend a little bit more time on like, hey, I got the general layout here, but what actually goes in there, right? Um, so those, that's where I would say next step far. Um, but you're at, at that good spot where you've got enough momentum in your planning to be able to carry that into your code or just kind of finalize out the planning and to dive right into it. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, that was my initial like problem is because I felt like I didn't have enough, but then I also had too much. So it's just like kind of just like trimming the fat in areas where it didn't need to be and then replacing it where it needed to be kind of yeah. thing. Cool. Good work. Um, any other Um, Yeah, I mean, my main roadblock so far has been just thinking about um, 
mainly like uh, how to get that database of information. Um, Cause I've had some people like kind of like, talking with some people and it was just like, oh, you should just focus on like local wild, like flora and fauna or, you know, just crops or, you know, even just like trees and things like that. So it's really just been mainly figuring out what would be an appropriate like data set size to work with that I'm not, you know, working on an entire <laughs> project within itself just to get the information that I that I feel would make it appropriate. Yeah, and I think this goes for uh, most uh, taxon ideas of this isn't necessarily about getting a huge data set. This is about like your differentiator, right? Like why are people going to use your app? Um, and they're going to use that because, like, they're going to want to blog about what they're doing, and that journal layout is perfect for them to show their progress, right? Or they're going to want to do that because there is a small community of garden-minded people, or it's not like Instagram or like another group, another group. Of yeah, people. exactly. People are going to go on your site for that in particular. So, um, advice that I have is don't focus in necessarily on um, on just the content side of things just get going on like what are the features that my users actually need and then i can always fill that database in down the road or potentially even partner with an existing website where i can just link out to that information okay beautiful good work thank you have fun. all right okay do i have to unmute or like will i just hear me no, okay good. All right. Um, so yeah, just really quickly, my project is basically uh, an application that allows people to set up games. You know, I, the best way to kind of describe it is like pickup games. A lot of times people do that with their friends, but you know, if your friends aren't around or something, I would like an app that allows people to, you know, set up a game at a certain place in time and other people can see that game listed and possibly join or make one of their own. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. So this is what I have now. Uh, my idea of it is to try to make it uh, keep it one page. I like single page applications, so I would like to keep everything here. But um, that kind of ties into my roadblock is I'm not really sure if that's possible or how to do it. But it's pretty simple from here. You can see there's a filter. Uh, we'll first have a link to sign up or log in if you're not already. Um, and underneath you have filters, you know, based on the sport, based on the distance from you. The kind of surface that they're playing on um, and like when the game is going to happen and to the right I kind of have an example of how I would like the games to look you know so like after someone would post a game that's how it would look um, to people signing in and they would see you know there's a game happening here or there um, so yeah that's pretty much it um, in five weeks what I would like to have is I mean definitely incorporate more JavaScript into it um, be storing users um, ideally storing information in general um, and I, again, the, my biggest roadblock is just kind of figuring out what is possible to do on a single page. I'm sure there's some stuff that I might have to make another page for, but, um, if I can keep it on one page, that'd be ideal. Yeah. So it's been single page applications are, are abbreviated as spa, um, spa apps are, uh, super, super popular. Uh, it's what react kind of enables you to build very efficiently. Um, the login side of things we will wait until we have like a fully functional database so that will come later in the program um but as we work on there's a uh a page that uh, a project will build for a movie theater and the movie theater you'll be able to like select different movies that are playing and see the seats that are available and then click on those seats and mark it as like i want to buy these um once we get to that application there's a lot based off of what you've already built that you can start saying like oh this is how I can filter through that data or here's how uh throwing it back to yesterday's class right where we had that object you can kind of see that object starting to form with like the sport is going to be the key and then basketball will be the value right surface okay that's the key and that's the value right you can kind of start envisioning it from there um, so there will be project by project as we go through class, kind of start tying that back to your capstone, right? Try, and, try to start thinking about, all right, what are those next steps of like, how can I take this that I did in the project and apply it into my capstone? Now, part of the capstone is redoing your code, right? Because you're going to get all of this working in JavaScript. And then it's like, just kidding. Here's an a easier way to do it in React. 
but that's intentional because once you get out in the workforce, that happens all the time, right? Of you write all of this code, you get it working. And then you're like, well, the first time I wrote it all, I learned a better way to do it. And now I want to go back and do it all over again. Um, and that's called refactoring. That's just a way of life. And that's intentional in the capstone when you get to that, that point of uh, needing to go through and, and refactor all of that. Um, so anyway, awesome progress. You uh, are also a, a check-in ahead, um, which which happens a lot, right? Because sometimes uh, um, we 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 gotta like get enough momentum and content up in class in order to be able to apply it to the capstone. Um, so you got your second check-in already met in terms of having some HTML built. So now you get to have a little bit more fun as we cover the JS concepts of figuring out how to integrate them in. Sounds good. Awesome work. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? I think you're good. All right. Um, so I don't have a screen to share, but my capstone project, at least at, as of this moment, is a couponing app. I had to pivot. I was going to do something with like caregiver type things, and I realized that care.com does it a lot better and more efficiently than what I was going to do. So the, basically the premise for my coupon app is you can select coupons that would be available for the store that you plan on going into. Um, and it's probably going to have to be regional. So say you want to go to Price Chopper. So you go to the Price Chopper drop down and it'll let you know all coupons that are available um, during that time frame that would work for you. And um, that's basically what I'm trying to accomplish. And what I plan on doing for the next five weeks is start coding, um, getting some pictures, and possibly do links to websites for the individual stores. Um, I don't want to keep it just regional for the Northeast. I want to do it for the for the U.S. So I know there are a lot of different um, supermarkets, and I also have to do some more research um, for like couponing in general because I know it's a a big industry. And where I'm roadblocked at the moment is trying to determine how many like top city links I want to do. Because if I look at cities by population, not everyone is necessarily a top city, if you will. So I have to determine what I want to do there. I'm also considering if I want to do it in other languages. It seems that most coupons in America are in English. Um, I haven't seen any in Spanish. I'm thinking that potentially could be an untapped market. I'd have to do more research on that. Um, and I also have to come up with a name. Um, preliminary names I've used are used already within the couponing community. So I got to find something that isn't, I guess, available or that's the, something that is available at the moment. Um, so I would say focus in on um, less, again, less important about the content and the coupons itself and more about that user interface, right? Of what's the first thing that user sees, right? Now, okay, that's the city list. Uh, they click into that city list. What's the next filter level down, right? Um, are people going to your site because they want to see all the coupons available in the area or are they going to your site because they always shop at Wegmans and when they go to your site, they want to go to their city uh, Wegmans and see what's available to them, right? Um, the other thing I would say is um, focus in on your data source because you're not going to be updating your website every day with coupons in every city in America, right? So start looking into what APIs are, are available to you. Maybe you find a coupon site that is already collecting those coupons and you can find a way to integrate that data into your site. Um, so those would be my suggestions. And then also think feature set wise, um, once all of those coupons show up, once they filter down and they say Syracuse Wegmans, uh, all right, now I want to see the coupons, what then? Is the goal for them to just open it and print it? Or is there some way that they can add coupons to, you know, a list and then print all of them out all together? Um, so those are those are things that that I would think about. Um, of okay, where's where's the data source? What are the screens that the users are seeing? And then what's that end result? Why are people coming to your website? Okay. 
Karen, would you like to do a capstone check in? Actually, I'm just going to give you a little bit of 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 a <laughs> um okay so i'm gonna just go in the order you guys are in uh in my uh zoom screen i'm not really sure how zoom determines the order i think some of it is like the order that you join class in um but i've never really figured out what the zoom order is so if uh, you feel singled out I, I apologize but we'll switch over to you guys remotely uh and go from there so jennifer you are in my top left Oh, you're on mute. There we go. There you go. Okay. So I can't seem to um to just do the wireframe. It's called Family Finder. And this is really uh, about animals who have to leave their families because that family can't take care of them any longer financially or because of their physical health. Maybe they have to move to a nursing home. God forbid that person dies. This animal now needs a new home instead of getting left behind and being stuck in a shelter. So it's pretty basic, but you've just got sections where you can contact somebody, sign up. You've got like a gallery where you can see the different animals that are available for adoption. Can you see the screen okay? Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, a few for the first page a spot to the About Us, Available Animals, and the Animal Information. The Application Donation page and a Contact page. So what I want to see happen in the next five weeks is that I actually have this mock-up kind of finished and that I can start gritting it out and writing the code for it. But my obstacle right now is that I don't know how to make pages for administrators. So I have to have some way of editing, deleting, um, and figuring out if I want users to delete info or up just update information. Um, and I just have can't conceptualize what an admin page would look like or how I would make that. Beautiful. So for the admin page, don't get two in your head, right? So think about, hey, what what needs to show up, right? What do I need control over? Okay, I need the ability to be able to delete anyone's post. How do I go in and find their posts and, and add a delete, right? Um, one approach that you can take for that is saying, hey, I'm going to make out this entire page in my HTML, then I'm going to copy and paste the page and call it that page name dash admin. And then I'm going to modify that page and add, add in the things that an admin should be able to do that a regular user shouldn't be able to do. We'll get into uh, later in the bootcamp how to log in and show different screens and all of that kind of stuff. But for now, you can kind of get around that by just copying and pasting that page, duplicating the page, and then tweaking it for those admin permissions. So um, something to think about. Uh, and an admin page can kind of be one of two things. One, it can either be a user-modified page. Um, so this is what the user sees, and then the admin sees a little bit more on that page. Or the admin page may be an entirely separate page that only admins can see. 
So those are two things to think about, right? Is, hey, am I adding additional admin functionality onto a page? Or am I making an entirely separate page so admins have con uh, control or access to features that other uh, users shouldn't have access to? So you, you've got your wireframes really well thought out. I love seeing everything that's gone into this. Now next steps are just dive in, right? Pick a page and just start going at it. Using that CSS, that bootstrap grid, um, you know, getting those pages created, try and use your A tags, your anchor tags, and go from there. Um, but I think you're in a, in a really good spot with your wireframes. Now it's time to like dive into the code side of things. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Bobby, I have you up next. And if anyone has um, feedback, by the way, in person or virtually for, for the uh, student, feel free to unmute and, and chime in. So as of right now, um, I was kind of doing two things because we talked about um, what I wanted to do with the capstone with the debug slash plant identifier app. Um, so I've been kind of trying to wireframe that out and then like kind of also like mock up my plan B just in case I decide to go another route. <clears throat> but um, so mostly right now, just on paper planning, I'm trying to, I guess my biggest roadblock would be like trying to figure out a way to, so it's not so simple, like as far as like just the layout of it, trying to kind of add more style into it, more uh, complexity. Um, you want to share what your idea is with the class? Oh, it was a uh, like a bug slash plant identifier app. Uh, so basically, just like take a picture of it with your phone, and it brings up information on, you know, exactly what it is. Maybe some facts about it, or you know, things like that. <clears throat> um, what I want to work on is start actually writing the code for it and kind of getting things, you know, laid out more so I can see how it looks and, you know, it'd be easier to make, you know, kind of them little tweaks here and there. <laughs> yeah. So I would say, um, you know, focus on, um, focus less in on the simplistic side of things of, Hey, I'm going to scan this and it's going to show up and more on the, what happens after they scan it. What does that page look like? What information is going to show up about that item, right? Am I going to use some third-party database that has a lot of that information in it? And if so, what information does that database have that needs to show up in my app? So 99% um, of the time, starting in the code is actually the worst place to start, right? Um, if you don't know what it's going to look like, playing around in the code isn't going to help you figure that out. What will help you figure that out is... Um, wireframing it out or just starting an outline, right? And being like, what information is supposed to show up when I do scan this thing? And oftentimes for a database that large, the answer won't just be what you want to show up. The answer will be what information that you have access to. So I would uh, start looking at other third-party databases and saying, hey, what data can I, is, is available about these plants, right? Maybe go to the library and get out like a botany book and be like, okay, what shows up about every different plant in upstate New York kind of thing? Um, and, and that should help you start to um, kind of narrow in, even if it's only two or three screens in your app, that will help you understand uh, you know, what, what you want to include in yours. Definitely. I have a question. Shoot. Seeing that um, we have to do a, a web app or whatever, how would Bobby's idea work? Considering that you'd have to take a picture and I feel like, you know, nobody's going to carry around their laptop. <laughs> yeah, so there, um, uh, iOS and Android both support uploading a photo on, into a web page. Um, and they also now support uh, triggering the camera. So uh, if you go on, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, there, are, there are websites that support when you hit choose the file, it gives you basically on, on iPhone three options to either uh, upload a photo, go to your files to find a photo or open the camera to take a picture of it. 
Um, Bobby was looking into um, Google's computer vision library, uh, which would allow, uh, allow an image to be uploaded and then allow Google to kind of do that uh, recognition of the plant or the bug or whatever it is. Um, but that's a major if, right? If you can't get that working, um, then you kind of can pivot your capstone into, oh, well, maybe I can just search by the name of it and still have that, that information come up. Uh, at which point you can focus in on like building your own database for some stuff or uh, integrating more with third party APIs and maybe cross referencing two APIs in together or there are a lot of directions you can go with that. Um, but I know some of you guys have ideas where you're like, well, if I can get this to work, I really want to do this. Otherwise, you know, I need to change the, the core idea of the app. Um, or go to, go to a plan B. Um, and that happens sometimes, but that's kind of what you want to invest in now. Of, hey, if we don't have next steps for diving into the code, we want to look at our third party partners and the data coming in and making sure that we can get access to that data to integrate it into our tech stuff. That was good information. It, kind of, it relates to where I am right now as well, so. Beautiful. Um, Clyde, have you up next? Uh, I'm gonna share the screen. Sure, go for it. Can you all see it fully? Yes, yes. you're good. <laughs> Okay. Uh, right now, I just have everything uh, laid out in like uh, in the paper just to get an idea. So next five weeks. Uh, okay, my project is about emergency department. So I want to have like a, how the uh, how the ambulance or nine one one coordinate with the, any emergency department. That's my first uh, thing, and then how this emergency department. Uh, can uh, so i i want to have like three different interface one is with the emergency department coordinating with the hospital and another one is patients like any patients if i want to go to uh, emergency department i want to have my own interface where i can access everything and i can do online check like it's like a check in like before going there based on uh, so that uh, my wait list, uh, like my waiting time will be approximated based on my emergency need and stuff. Uh, so right now I just have the uh, layout. Uh, so next five weeks plan is to for me to make the wireframe to get more idea. Like uh, I, I have some idea, but I still want to figure out what all like, uh, you know, because I don't know much about uh, administration side or hospital side, what all things needs to be added. So I'm thinking about those things. Um, so I think that's it. So, uh, okay. So, I, I'm, liking, I'm liking the outline. I think you have good progress there. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about like, hey, what does the hospital really need here? Or like, what's the hospital process? I think that that's one of those things that you can make some assumptions on. Um, and then focus in on like, okay, what do what does the user need to know? The user cares about the most part being able to like share what their their condition is, right? Oh, I've got a broken arm, or you know, I I'm here because my appendix hurts, or whatever like that. Um, and then on the uh, administrator side or on the hospital side, um, them being able to see that information and being able to like update the status or the waiting time for that patient, right? So obviously there's a lot that can go into waiting times and how do I calculate all of that out? So I can see uh, based off of what you're sharing your screen here is that uh, you're already thinking about all of these different functions. So I would start thinking about like the process behind those functions. Uh, okay, if we have all of this information in here, how do we calculate that waiting time, right? Um, and, and the answer to that doesn't have to be perfect. 
Um, you don't need to dive into like, oh, well, the average waiting time for someone with a broken arm is this specific number, right? If you just come up with that loose system, um, I think that would be really helpful. But because you have so many of your screens thought out, don't worry about having every detail plan before you start building those screens. Because as you start building the screens, I think a, a little bit more of how the functionality of those screens is actually going to work. Um, but I think you've got a really good um, structure here and you'll probably benefit from just diving into the code and starting to build out the screens. And I think the rest will come up there. Thank you. Really good, really good uh, progress. Um, I, I am uh, butchering Kali's idea here, but um, you guys have been to the DMV and they have those waiting monitors up and they call your ticket number. Um, Kali's trying to do that for the hospital, right? So you can be like, how long am I going to be here? And the hospital staff can use the same interface and like update the waiting room status and, and all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, it's kind of DMV meets like uh, restaurant check-in where like they can be like, hey, your table's ready. Like, hey, we're finally ready to deal with your broken arm. Uh, so that's that's Kali's idea, which I, I absolutely love. So awesome work. Thank you. Uh, Torres, you're up next. Hello, I'm going to share my screen. Go for it. All right, so I'm working on a, um, a food delivery app for um, either grocery or uh, restaurant items. Um, so I have a, the wireframe and also an outline done. I have uh, seven screens for the app so far. Uh, this is the outline, just detailing what each of the seven screens are for. And um, so far, this is a wireframe for the seven screens. So this is the home screen and the second page. So a quick overview of the pages I have so far. So that's what I have. I pretty much have the wireframe completed. Um, what I have to plan, what I plan, uh, what I plan to do by the next check-in is I plan to have the HTML and CSS completed, as well as um, some JavaScript. I really plan to have that done by this by this check-in, but I definitely plan to have that completed by the next check-in here. Um, I don't really have any real roadblocks at this point. Uh, I may encounter some by the time I really get into the code, but I don't really have any at this point. I don't I don't know exactly what tools I need to complete this project um, outside of HTML, CMS, CSS, and JavaScript. But you know that's where I figure I might run into some roadblocks. Is you know I may run into a language or a tool that I that I'm not familiar with. Um, so. But we'll see once that once that comes. Yeah, I, I love the um, I love seeing through on your your wireframes that you've thought through kind of like not just the basic stuff of what needs to go on this screen, but um, thinking through like oh I need a nav bar right, and then like where does that nav bar go? Or hey I've gotten a list of all of my items here, but when they click on an item, what does that screen look like? Those are like little details that are really easy to to forget. Um, until you get into your code and then you're like, oh crap, I don't know what this page looks like because I forgot them in my wireframes, right? So um, really good progress on having that uh, detailed out and thought through. Um, so next steps are don't worry about the JavaScript, right? You're going to learn that. Don't worry about the React stuff. You're going to learn that. Don't worry about the database stuff. You're going to learn that. Focus in on what you do know, right? So uh, you know HTML, you know CSS, you know how to uh, lay things out on the page and get them to show up. So that's where you really want to focus in on. Uh, don't worry too much about like the unknown or where you're headed next and just narrow that down in on, hey, I've got seven really detailed wireframes. Let me get them singing in my code and looking the way I want them to. And by that point, you'll be ready for that JavaScript of being able to layer in that interactivity. Okay, definitely. Awesome, awesome work. Thank you. Uh, Tikai, have you up next? <clears throat> okay. Um, so I was gonna do 
uh, the try clothes on virtually type thing, but my daughter decided that she wants to uh, sell bracelets and she is selling them to her friends and she wants to um, have a web page where she can, where her friends can uh, uh, place their orders. And um, so right now I don't have um, something on and I should have, I, I saw how some people did the screenshots and I should have done that, uh, but uh, I have it on paper. So she has her, her, the pictures of her bracelets, like her, um, I don't know what you want to call them. That's probably something, uh, like her, her mainstream type line. And then she wants to have, uh, somewhere where you can, uh, place orders where they're customized. So I'm working on, on, uh, having something where they can, uh, do their special requests. And then, um, well, this is kind of out of order, but um, they she wants them to be able to log in and place their orders. And uh, if they want to um, customize their stuff, they can. They have a page where they can uh, do certain customizations. Um, and right now, so right now, all I have is um, pages, uh, basically on on paper, and I can take pictures of them. I guess later, um, but uh, I think that's where I'm at, at trying to figure out what she wants to do. Um, I, okay, I guess, I guess, I think that's where I'm at because I was okay. else and then she kind of said this and she was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And so I was like, okay, I can help you do that. So I'm trying to help her do that. And so I had to, she's taking pictures of her bracelets and she has a bunch of pictures that we're going to upload and see if we can even make a web page with her pictures. And Perfect. then from there. Yep. So those are the next steps you want to narrow in on, right? Uh, all right. How do I get these pages set up? Um, how do I make it so that when I click on one of the bracelets, I not only see like a picture of it, but then see the customization? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you'll want to go back to um, the registration form homework assignment, uh, the one that you did on free code camp, because that's got a bunch of different form inputs with it, right? So you can start taking the knowledge from there and applying it into your capstone of, hey, I want a drop down to show up, or, um, hey, they should be able to enter like a name that they want to show up on the bracelet or um, that kind of stuff. So start thinking through that and then also think through kind of the marketplace side of things of what happens when they hit place order. Do they need to, do we need any additional information about that, right? Their name or their email or their phone number or their address, or um, are we going to have um, some confirmation message that shows up that says like bracelet order received, um, all, all of that kind of stuff. So um, I think you're on the right track uh, on, on your wireframes. Now it's time to like dive in and take all that HTML we've learned and start building out the papers. Okay, all right. Okay. Awesome work. Uh, Ayub, I have you up next. Yep, hello. Um, so my project or capstone, um, I've been thinking of and been searching the last couple of days of um, usable APIs and tools that could help me uh, bring this project alive um, was a, I think I will start it as a web page, um, as a website, since I don't have enough knowledge to make it as a an app yet. Um, but it will be a real estate um, um, website where um, I will use an, uh, an API that's updated um, in the US uh, daily. Um, it will tell you the, um, the properties near your area that you might want to buy or look into. Um, and they will be on the first page, it will be um, um, uh, a toolbar or a search bar where you can search and put the location you are interested in. And then based on that, um, related the properties will show up. And uh, there's also another, probably right under this uh, the location, I will have two search bars where one you'll put in 
how many bedrooms you would want or interested in. And one is um, it will be almost like a selection type choices where you choose the, um, what type of houses or properties you want to see first, the newest or the price low to high or price high to low and those kind of options. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I, I really like this API that I found, which allows you to um, have daily updated um, uh, web, uh, pr uh, properties uh, and, and hopefully it will be great fun to go through these roadblocks and challenges in the future. Cool. So what are your next steps? Uh, my next steps first is put um, lay the foundation down, which is the website and how it would look and the colors, um, the overall format. And then I will um, uh, start um, probably by next week, um, importing and using APIs by JavaScript. Uh, and then, yeah, maybe by the next appointment, the website will semi look ready. Uh, yeah, but so, yeah, for the next steps are HTML and the CSS and the overall format of the website. Beautiful. Um, yeah, hold off on any of the API stuff. Um, we've got an entire two week coming up right after the JavaScript module on using APIs and integrating that data, getting it to show up on the page, all of that kind of stuff. So um, love that you have the focus on like, hey, this is the API I already know I want to use. Um, hold off on actually integrating that data. Um, that will be coming right after the JavaScript module. So for now, uh, fill it with kind of dummy data, right? Start building out your pages, start having the multiple properties show up, uh, start building out that individual property page. So when you click on it, what does it look like? Um, all of that you can kind of just make with the same house, right? Download some random yeah. house picture and uh, put in dummy data for now, but base all of that off of the information you know that you can get from that API. Um, you know, what, what information is flowing back that's what you want to get built out in your HTML and your CSS for that next check-in. Okay. Awesome work. Uh, Karen, I have you up next. The student Karen, I have you up next. Okay, so the... I have no um, wireframe to show you. I have nothing to show you um, as of yet that is even presentable. <laughs> but I'm working on a on an app that is based on um, beauty, um, hair specifically. Um, that's uh, identifying a couple of different things. Um, it's identifying your um, hair texture and your hair type because hair texture and hair type are two completely different paradigms. Um, also uh, product recommendations based on hair texture and hair type, as well as, um, as well as um, recommendations on how to treat and take care of hair specific to its texture and type. Um, I also wanted to have this app be kind of connected to like a, like a weather service, um, only because uh, depending on the, obviously, you know, the weather, the dew point, the humidity, uh, precipitation would really, um, be a determining factor on how you would one, wear your hair, style your hair, or if your flat iron is even going to last, right? Because 80% humidity, your flat iron is not going to last. Also that is recommended as far as like, um, uh, regionally is concerned. Um, people from Seattle, they're going to have different hair issues than people from New York they're going to have ha different hair issues than people from Miami, right? And of course, depending on the months as well. Uh, and eventually, um, another link to purchasing these specific beauty items based on your hair texture. So, of course, the my first page was just a, 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 a sign-in page. Um, uh, um, a sidebar of different recommendations, uh, well, not recommendations, excuse me, of um, different hair types and how to identify 
that. So of course it would be like a questionnaire, right? Um, when it comes to identifying hair textures, you have to take a look at how the hair behaves. So a couple of the prompts would be, okay, well, can you flat iron your hair and it stay flat iron for a week or two? Most likely you have coarse hair, right? Um, if you straighten your hair and you're starting at the bottom. By the time you get to the top, did the bottom swell up? Most likely you have fine hair. Um, how does your hair react in this temperature? How does your hair react uh, when it's cold? Do you find yourself uh, having a difficult time transitioning? Um, what kind of uh, products and tools you use in order to uh, combat your hair uh, issues? That way that would um, identify the actual hair texture that you would do. And from that, um, it would provide, my app would provide um, specific, well, suggested hairstyles for uh, you to do based on that hair type. Hairstyles to avoid, because not all hairstyles are created equal and not all textures should be receiving those hairstyles, right? And so, so I think you've got a lot of great ideas here. We got to narrow it down. Yes, right? yeah, yes. We are way beyond MVP here, right? Yes. So what is what is going to be your differentiator? What are, is going to drive people to your app? And they're going to say, the number one reason I'm using this is this idea. Because otherwise, I think the, the reason why you're, you might be um, intimidated by your wireframes is because you've got so many ideas that you want to get into them that you're like, whoa, right? Like login screen and now what? And so I, I love that you're narrowing in on like, First things first, this is all about you and, and the, the, the you as, as your hair type driving the, the app, right? So let's ask those questions. Let's start figuring out what your hair type is. Let's start narrowing down on what those questions are, right? Then once they complete that quiz, once we get that hair type figured out and, and all the properties that go into that, right? Not just hair type, but the texture that you already identified, right? And maybe coloring is, is impacting it, or maybe you, you are the expert there. I do not want to, to encroach on that territory, right? But um, okay, once we get that data selected, what, are, what is the primary purpose of the app? Is the primary purpose to recommend products? Is the primary purpose to recommend what hairstyles they could try next? Is the primary purpose to give them two recommended hairdos based off of uh, the weather? I really like the weather idea. That's new. I haven't heard that yet, right? So maybe we narrow down our MVP and say, hey, what my app is going to do is it's going to help you get to know your own hair. And then it's going to tell you what the external forces at B are going to do to your hair, right? I know I walk across campus two times faster today because there was about 20 degrees colder outside, right? <laughs> I can only imagine how that would impact my hair. So maybe narrow down that, that MVP idea and then get to those wireframes, right? Because I think once you have that narrowed in, it's going to be much easier to build out those screens and get to the code side of things. But narrow in those wireframes on what are those core features and then shoot for the code for the, that next, that next check-in. Okay. And by the way, if anyone is working on their wireframes and they change something or they have some code made already and want it reviewed, you don't need to wait until all the way until the next check-in to, to show that. Schedule those one-on-ones, right? Even if you don't need help and just want to show your progress, those one-on-ones are just as fun for me as they are for you, right? So or hopefully they are fun for both of us. That's not what I was trying to imply. Um, sorry, I realized how that came out. Um, schedule the one-on-ones, right? Those, those capstone, those one-on-ones are not just for, hey, I'm struggling on something. They can also be, hey, you said something in class and I wanna go on a tangent, or hey, I feel like there's a lot going on in my app or I'm not sure what the next steps are. Those are what those one-on-ones are, are definitely for. Okay, thank you. Great ideas. I just want to see them manifest, right? I want to see them out of your head and onto the paper 
or onto the uh, whiteboard or onto Figma or wherever they are, because I think from there you'll be able to kind of snowball that right into the, the code uh, for, for those next steps. Sounds good. Uh, Naj, I have you up next. Uh, never mind. Um, go to Niaja next. Okay, I wasn't sure if you were trying to say my name at first. No, 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 I was not. <laughs> okay. I have Naj and Niaja as, as two separate, but it looks like Naj dropped out of the room. So uh, we will go on to you next. Okay, so I don't have nothing to show because I wrote mine down. It looks like scribble scrabble. So you guys want to understand it. But anyways, I came up with like a recipe website I want to do. So you don't have to look up different website, different recipes on different multiple different websites. So basically you can upload your recipe, you can look up recipes and you can upload like pictures of the recipe, stuff like that. Um, I started, I did my wireframe. And I'm almost done with the outline of the code that I need to do. And then I guess my only roadblock would be I wanted to, I don't know how I'm going to design the website. If that makes sense. So um, don't be afraid to swing by Staples and get a, a, like colored pens or pencils and like start drawing it out if you're a visual person. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you are not a visual person and you want to just be like, I want to get everything on the site first, right? So let me just like, I've got my layout figured out in my wireframe, right? So um, if you're at the point where you're like, mm, I, I have these wireframes done, but I still don't know how to start on my code or I'm still not envisioning what it will look like in the website in terms of layout invest a little bit more time into the wireframes, right? Start thinking through, okay, I drew a box here for my nav bar, but what's actually gonna be in my nav bar? Oh, I need a search bar. I need a categories link. I need a homepage link, right? Start thinking through kind of that stuff. Once you get the layout done, sometimes it's easier to get all of the layout done code-wise. And then once you have all that layout done, it's very easy to say like, oh, look, I already have a div called nav bar. Maybe I want to put a background in on my nav bar. Or maybe I'm not really a designer, but I like this coding stuff. Maybe I go to Bootstrap and I just use Bootstrap's components and designs. And that's what I'll bring into my site, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have a lot of options there. Don't get too hung up on like, but I don't know what the final thing is going to look like yet keep on going. I love that you are, you identified that stepping stone, right? Of, oh, I have my wireframes done, but I'm not jumping into my code just quite yet because I'm doing that outline, right? And I'm figuring out where those divs are going to be. That is really showing that like, all right, I'm learning, I'm learning the steps here. I'm breaking this down like an engineer. And now I'm ready to, to turn that into my code. So um, sometimes it is better to just like get it all out on the page, get it all laid out properly. And then the style comes to you, comes to you after. Um, and if it doesn't, that's when we can start looking at bootstrap and being like, oh, well, this isn't going to look bad if I use bootstrap components for everything. Maybe I find a way to incorporate that in. Okay. Uh, good work. Patrick, I have you up next. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> All right. So I only I only have the uh, um, cap, the not the capstone, what is it called? The, the wireframe done. And I've, I've still been adding stuff to it. All right, is it sharing? Yes, we're good. Okay. All right, so I was really getting into it, but I don't think I need all this information, but I've been doing it. Um, so basically, what I told you last time is that I'm trying to create a website that is uh, specifically generated towards uh, youth that end up either homeless or don't know what to do moving out of their parents' house, you know, just any kind of resource that they can like, or program that they can get access to. I want this website to be that. So I, am I just showing you? My bad. <laughs> um, it's like I have the the homepage, uh, all the links that would be these pages, uh, introduction to the website and stuff. 
And then these are what the links would be. So like I have to create a, um, a link to it. Like this is an example of my resources. This is an example of the page that would be for homeless prevent, per, prevention, like description on the company that would be able to help them and reach out. Um, mental health, health awareness. This one was a little hard, but I'm going to figure this out later on of what to exactly put in there. Um, and then I also did like communities, like there's group discussions, like where people can like interact. I put interactive message board where people can connect with one another and like, you know, like, be like, oh, I did this, cho uh, choose this, pro chose Vera House for this if you're in a domestic abuse uh, situation. And then I also did donation pages where we have a, where like you can like donate and stuff. Now, this is funny because I just added this. Um, for the donation so page, I did I a, would say, think, think one level deeper on this stuff, right? So, Hey, all of these pages are great. How do I get to them? How do I get back to the homepage? Oh, you know, I need to <laughs> I add a nav bar on that too, there, like right? homepage up here. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, other stuff like, um, you know, you have interactive message board. Yes. Oh, well, I'm not going to go to my code and just be like, interactive message board. All right, great. I'm done. Think through what, what that interactive message board looks like, right? Oh, I probably need to see other people's posts, and I need a text box to type in my own post. And then even down to the detail of, oh, I need a, a send button or a post button when I'm done typing in my message to put it up there, right? Because yeah. what you're going to find is all of those details are going to impact your layout. Yeah. So I think that you've got the 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 core screens thought through and the general information that needs to show up on them. But you know, for things like contacts, well, is contacts uh, can I get away with that being a one line thing, or is there going to be multiple lines of contacts? Is there going to be their website and their email and their phone number and their hours? Oh well, if yeah, I yeah, need... more generalized like that. That's what I put contacts are there for to just like generalize this is where the information would be for email and phone numbers for them to or e yeah to uh, contact them uh, I also created this side to uh, this evening uh, where you can be able to have an option to create an account so that you can keep track of like um, your don like if you're going to donate personal money and uh to these programs and stuff, you can be able to keep track of that. There can be in a, I was thinking even deeper, you could have an about me where it, where you say, oh, I'm a person who actively like helps people that um, experience homelessness or, you know, there's people that actually, I learned in, from going to New York City is they run it, is they don't, they let uh, homeless kids stay with them temporarily while they're going through programs. So that's an, another option. He, and then also I was doing like a store merchandise where like, um, or like a little store for like, if I were to come up with a logo or something, and then all the proceeds that I made from that would go to, um, specific foundations. I have a bunch of ideas I'm trying to like cram all together, so, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I would say the goal of a wireframe is that you could hand that to, to a developer and say, Hey, go build this for me and get the output that you want. Right. Yeah. So if you are are looking at, um, you know, any of these pages and a developer saw interactive message board, it would be like, well, I can make some assumptions about what you want an interactive message board to be, but I'm not really sure what you had envisioned there. So I would say, look at all of those screens and figure out like, what's that MVP? Right. What is that? Hey, this is the core website that I need to build and then narrow down in on those wireframes and say, is all of the information in here, in my head, showing up on here, right? Okay. If it is something like description and description is gonna be a paragraph long, okay, yeah. we don't need to flesh out more of those details. But for something like contact, hey, if I even have their name and uh, or uh, their email address and their phone number, how am I going to style that? How much space is that gonna take up on the yeah. screen? that's what you want to flesh out a little bit more in those wireframes in addition to having like 
hey, what's my nav bar look like, right? What's the what's the core um, consistency across these screens or how am I going to get around from one to the other? So I would spend just a little bit more time on those screens that you determine are, uh, are, are kind of like the requirements um, are in that MVP scope. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then bring that, but think about that of, hey, all of those links are there. What are those links? Right. So that's when you can actually put in instead of link, put resources in one of them. Right. And then put in sign in in another one. Right. Just thinking yeah. through a little bit more. What does the final product look like? Let me make sure that's captured in my wireframes. And then you'll be in a good spot to dive in code side. OK. And I think that's I think that's it right now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good work. That's right. It's over here. Jordan, I have you second to last. Oh, shit. All right. Um, here we go. Now you're muted. Yeah. Word. So cool. <laughs> Jerk. All right. Um, let me get this out of the way because it's going to mess with my thing. All right. So I am do my capstone project is a like at first it was going to be like a retro anime streaming site. But then like I'm not an otaku like that. Like I can't just watch anime all day. So I kind of want to put like, I don't know, just a bunch of 80s retro bullshit in there. Like I'm talking like Arnold Schwarzenegger movies like bad B film movies. And I have access to a lot of those things that I could use to stream easily. Um, it's just whether or not I can use those databases. So like for the homepage, let me share my screen. Is, oh, it's already sharing. Um, so like at first, like right now I'm working on a logo design. Um, I have help from some people at my job, uh, which is TCG player. Like their artwork is out of this world, but I'm kind of trying to work on it on my own also. So it can be like my own logo. Um, but I realize now that I have nav bar in here twice. So I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that because that doesn't belong there. Um, but what I wanted to do was put like, I don't know, like you get there and it's your homepage. Um, so you can like search some of the stuff that you know we have on the website or like just search a genre when you get on there. And it would take you farther in, obviously. But like I want the social media links and the nav bar on the front page as well um, with probably some like personalized art and like a very specific background. Um, so basically what I wanted to do was like channels, like back in the eighties and like the nineties, I remember growing up and flipping the channels and it was a lot more fun to watch TV. Cause like we had funny commercials in between, like, kind of like, I don't know, like it would always be break time. Like instead of watching a two and a half hour long movie, oh like God, all the way through, right. You got time to get up, get snacks, do stuff. But like, instead of commercials and stuff, I kind of want to add in like, user art videos stuff like that um and there's plenty of it out there in the internet that people are willing to just allow me to use um but what i want is like multiple different live streams and channels that are already out such as like retro crush um and uh toku shotsu which is like all kaiju films and kaiju shows like common rider and stuff like that and then like i don't know like i could even have like very specific channels for very specific genres like down to mech or like mystery anime um something stupid like that but i want like a schedule also because on the live stream for those channels i want them all to adhere to like a specific schedule that i would be able to show people so that they could know that when they hop on at a specific time to watch it that their same online friends hop on the chat and they all share this like communal live stream like watch together but it's like not as much of a watch party um i want to add a spotlight for things like i don't know like anniversaries of things but not only that the most viewed stuff or new stuff or even updates to like i don't know like they released the original gundam in 1969 and just two years ago they just released a new installment of it which means that like it's technically still ongoing so i would add like something to the spotlight aspect here and obviously the, the nav bar is there um, this would be a media profile. So like if you did click on one of the like media, like something playing and you wanted to know more about it or you wanted to know like what episodes you missed because maybe we're streaming on like episode 10 and there's 27 episodes. 
you want to go back and watch those, it would be under episodes and recommended. Um, I want to do the so cover. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you like, off because you've I don't got know, a lot like of more them. interactivity. Like when you hover over it, maybe it changes to like some of the uh, like greater moments of the shows, like art that they have. Maybe I could like put that in there. Um, obviously, the description. So Jordan, I'm going right to cut you off. There the reason I put that to the second. left is Jordan? because Jordan, uh, we typically read from left to right. Um, so I want that to be the focal point of the screen so that people are more invested in the description as well as the genre and like learning something about it, as opposed to just seeing the cover art, clicking on it and going right for it. So I kind of made that like lesser on part of the screen. Um, recommended would obviously be recommended things that like, if you're watching um, Blue Submarine number six, no one knows what that is. Um, if you're watching X-Men or something, uh, they would recommend like something kind of like that or something along those lines. Um, I have a full screen, which I plan on doing. I've just been working so much that I really haven't had a chance to wow. get into coding, but I will be starting tomorrow. But this would be like an almost full screen. Um, maybe I was thinking like with the chat, possibly like, oh, let me not do that. Um, I was thinking like possibly having the chat do something like this where it would like be overlapping, like maybe at the bottom of the screen. Am I muted? I'm muted. Can Mother you hear me? No, no, no. This You're sucks. not muted. You have us <laughs> muted. Oh, I can't hear him. Why is that? Now I can hear I you. Showed you, the, the hand. you turned your computer down. And I forgot mine was down, bro. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We're laughing because I've been trying to like give you feedback for like two minutes you're on the screen across from me so you're kind of far <laughs> so so you have you have a lot of great stuff here first of all narrow down on that mvp second okay. of all what's going to help you understand why this is too much is breaking down some of this information right so it's okay. really easy to say schedule but what's the schedule look like Okay, are there going to be multiple, there's going to be multiple shows that show up there. So I want to break down what that schedule looks like visually to show like, hey, this is has 30 minutes left. And then this is what's coming on in the next hour. Well, right? what I was thinking is when you click on these separate channels, it would load that schedule to it. That That's fine. Functionality, that's fine. But I want to see that in your wireframe. I want to okay. see what the schedule looks like. I, I want to know what the chat looks like. Are you planning on having three chat messages show up or 10 chat messages show up? What's the difference between a user sent message and a message that I have sent? Nav bar is great. What links are going into the nav bar? Oh, Spotlight. Is Spotlight going to be one show that we're showcasing or is it going to be three shows that we're showcasing? What information is going to show up in the spotlight? Is it the show title? Is it the show title, the name and the description and the time, right? There's a lot of detail in here where it's like, I get the gist of the functionality, but you're going to dive into this code wise and then be like, uh, what goes in my spotlight? Uh, okay. What goes in my chat? Right. Yeah, it's so more in the mind's eye right now. So I like haven't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I didn't even think to do that, but you're very right. And I appreciate that because I was thinking that like earlier, like, I don't know how many would I showcase in the spotlight because I don't want to do like a top 10 and a top 10 for people who barely have any time at night, like when they get home to catch up with a live stream is kind of a lot to pick up on. Yep. So, so that's what I would say before you dive in code side, think through a little bit more of what each one of these components are, right? You've got that general component layout done. Love that. Focus in on what that's going to be. Start breaking up those gray boxes into smaller gray boxes, right? Start thinking about what's going to go inside of them. For something like live stream, yeah, great. That's a big video, right? We don't need to think more through what will be in that. But for the thing like your media profile, where you've broken it down into the director starring genre, that's the level of detail that I want to see, right? Okay. I want to see what's going to go into that spotlight. For the channel, probably don't, uh, above it, you probably don't need too many more details because that's just going to be the channel icon or the channel name, right? Yeah, like but, for, but for schedule, there are going to be a lot of smaller components that make that bigger structural layout. So that's okay. what I want to see a little bit more work on. Okay. 
awesome work. I, I love it. Like I, I see the passion. I see all of the ideas out there. Now just go one level deeper before you dive into your code. Okay. Also, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense because I don't even know what I want to put on my like user profile pages, like stuff, things, you know? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any ideas? If you have any ideas on what should go into like a user profile, I don't even like calling it an avatar. Um, if you could like, if anyone has any ideas, let me know. Cause I, I mean, I know what I want to see, but at the same time, I want it to like kind of solve a lot of problems that people commonly have, you know? Virtual popcorn. Virtual popcorn. Get out of here. Do you want to add the subtitle? Like, you know, uh, like some people have a problem if they are watching different language movies. So I watch everything with subtitles, even in English. Um, so uh, I plan on like that'll be like in the live stream, like at the bottom where the scrubber is. Do you want me to put like stuff like the scrubber and the button icons and stuff like that, too? Um, that isn't a bad idea. Um, the keep in mind that when you're using a streaming platform, they're going to like give you a, basically a, a code to drop in that's going to control like the play pause and volume control and all of that stuff. Yeah. So that's probably the only exception to where you don't need to get super detailed, but everything else you do want to be thinking down to that level of um, what what buttons do I need to control and all of that kind of stuff? All right, word. Beautiful. Um, looks like Elandra dropped out of the meeting. So we have made it to the end. Sorry, a couple minutes over break. Let's take a break until 7.30, only because I've got a lot of JavaScript to teach you guys tonight. Um, and we will see you back here at 7.30. Awesome capstone progress, everyone. Remember, next step here is getting your code built out, HTML, CSS. If you still feel lost, you probably have not spent enough time in your wireframes. So spend a little bit more time in your wireframes. If you are not feeling ready for the code, if you are still feeling lost, schedule one-on-ones with me. You do not want to put off your capstone until week 20 and then go, oh, crap, I've got a lot of work to do on this. But seeing, yeah. Oh. I'm sorry, Shiner. How did I miss you? Dang, I was hoping I, I hid. Oh, uh, Snyder, you thought you were off the hook. Yeah, I mean, I was off the hook till you caught on. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Um, I'm about to share my screen. Yeah, go for it. Uh, oop. So um, as you already know, I had the menu idea capstone, but then I was like, another capstone popped in my head. And um, I was discussing it with, I want to say Jason, when he was doing like the checkup, on, I mean, we're like, we're, to, we're talking about my progress and whatnot. And um, he just spawned more ideas, but I'm only keeping it at two, honestly. I don't really feel like getting myself overwhelmed. This is my second capstone IG, I, idea. It's called placeholder name it's not very creative it's just called ev now so um a little bit about it as we are now uh with the current environment and the society one or whatever evs are becoming a crazy trend um like for example we we're on your ev not too long ago and how i realized that the whole class had some uh thoughts about evs and um i wasn't alone can you hear me by the way okay i wasn't alone in that so i was like um and I also would like an EV down the road, but I don't know much about it. So I'm like, why not make a website that teaches us or gets us introduced into the world of EVs and their concepts? Like my biggest thing was range. And apparently that's a thing right here. Where's it at? Where's it at? It's a term, uh, range anxiety. Apparently it's a very common thing, you know, for the newcomers to EVs. And um, I happy I wasn't alone in that. And um, I found out, I've learned about things like the charging types. I didn't know EVs had charging types. I thought it was just all one simple or whatever. But apparently Teslas have a supercharging network where else like if Ford has an EV, it'd be like a type one or type two. So I learned about that um, as well as the charging networks and whatnot. I also want to make it like a, uh, this is where the MVP is going to come in. I don't know if I should make this a uh, a consumer site as well as a, like informational site. 
because I want to make it like users can compare um, EVs on the market and they can filter that by their price range, charge time, face the uh, safety features, and maybe configurations because configurations are annoying. I don't feel like I'll have the time to put that in there. Um, yeah, the website will break down terms, blah, blah, blah. It have gener general consumer information, like if you'll be saving more money compared to a gas car, maintenance costs, um, if uh, charging your car at home will spike that electricity bill, things like that. Um, little things like um, if you if your car is um, used, if you have tax credit applied, because I know that's a thing, um, tax credits are an incentive to um, have e EVs on the um, streets more. Um, what else, what else? And things like that, like also um, the uh, charging network, Syracuse is a developing city, I'd like to think of it as. So um, if I'm going to EV, I want to know, do I have these charging stations? Because I know Tesla's, um, they have their charging stations everywhere. But like, if I want to get a uh, other company or whatever that, that isn't as established, will I be able to charge it elsewhere? So um, I was thinking, yeah, we didn't learn APIs yet, but I already know APIs are going to be where I'm going to need to go to put this information up. So um, stations in your area, where I'd be Syracuse, Fayetteville, New, um, Liverpool, whatever. And uh, back to the consumer thing, if users decide, yeah, I'm going to look in Switch, I can, uh, I'll put direct links to companies so they can check out those EVs on their webpage. So my two problems are, I'm leaning towards this capstone just because it sounds more fun. Um, secondly, my two problems though are, um, I don't know how my website is going to look. I don't know how I'm going to place the content on the website. I don't know if I have, I'll probably end up having multiple pages, but I don't know like how it'll look yet. And my second problem is, um, will I be able to combine, you know, it being a consumer site and a general information site, or should I stick to one or the other? So yeah, that's so what I'm it, An information site is fine. Um, I'm, I'm seeing good uh, app functionality already in terms of like being able to compare different pieces of information and you'll have no problem integrating a database, right? So for every car, uh, you'll have information about the charge type and, and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I think that this is a good idea. Just, just kind of leapfrog yourself into those wireframes, right? Get that site envisioned in your head. This is a great uh, requirements list of all of the stuff that you want to incorporate into it. Wireframe it all out. Once you get that wireframe done, you can compare it to your pizza app and then be like, which one do I care about more? Which one am I having more fun with, right? Which one am I going to learn more from? And that's what's going to let you pick between the two of them. But once you get those wireframes done, just because you changed your idea, um, shoot me a Slack message when you have them finish and be like, okay, I, I'm picking this one or I'm picking this one. You know, did, did I think everything through on that? Uh, but your wireframes are what you want to focus in on at this point. And you've got all of those ideas brain dumped out of your head, which is the hardest part. Now get them into the wireframe. Now get a little bit more visual with them, um, whether it's diagrams.net or on paper or whatever it is. And then you should be able to decide which one you want to start coding out from there. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Sorry, Schneider, uh, for, for forgetting you. Um, I don't, I really don't know how I missed you on the list, but anyway, we are all set. Uh, uh, let's take a break. We'll be back at 7.35. That's yeah, 20 minutes, 7.35. I'll see you guys then. Oh, recording. Um, that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us of CDing down into that directory. Okay, from here, we are going to npm install prompts. Make sure you get the S at the end of that. And That's you easy. notice it, it put in a bunch of files over here that we didn't really ask for. That's OK. Package.json is keeping track of what dependencies our project uses. So if you send this project to someone else, you can open up that package.json and see all the other projects uh, or dependencies that NPM uh, installed for us. Package lock.json, you don't need to open. That's what happens under the hood. That's how 
um, NPM manages all the dependencies of our dependencies. Um, and then node modules is where actually all of this code lives. Um, so you see our props package got installed here. That's going to have all of the JavaScript inside of it that makes prompts work. In addition to two other packages, I'm not even going to attempt to uh, pronounce those, but those are dependencies of our dependencies, right? Okay, in order for prompts to work, those two other packages need to be installed. This is all under the hood stuff. I don't expect you guys to um, have a deep dive into this. NPM will kind of come back once we get into using Node more on the back end. But uh, always like to give a, a brief little explanation, right, of, of what all of that stuff is actually doing. OK. But we just have to have the index, or we have to put in package also? Um, if you NPM install prompts, if you run this command down here, uh, uh, Jennifer, it will create package.json, package.lock.json, and node modules for you. Could you please remind me how you got that terminal open at the bottom? Yeah. Uh, once you create index.js, if you right-click on it, you can open an integrated terminal. Thank you. No problem. And the the point of all of it um, is that like the we have to have in order to be able to use that third party package, we need to have that package downloaded basically. Um, and we also need any packages that that package needs also installed. So that's kind of what that node modules folder is doing. And then the package lock.json and the package.json are keeping track of what we have installed into node modules. So we'll, once we run that npm install command for us, it, npm is doing all of that work for us. We didn't create package.json. We didn't put the file contents in it. It just keeps track of all of that for us in those files. That way, if we close this project and come back to it three months later, and we're like, oh, we want to get this code running again, NPM knows, oh, here are the dependencies required to get that code running. Yep. Yep. Depending on what packages you need for that project. Yep. Now it's possible that you write node code like yesterday. We wrote all of our node code and didn't need any NPM, right? And node worked perfectly fine. But as soon as our code starts requiring in those dependencies, that's when we need the package.json and the node modules and all of that good stuff. So speaking of that, we can actually require in our prompts package. So this prompts needs to line up with whatever the NPM package is. So this is the way that we're kind of bridging the gap from NPM by requiring in this prompts package. We're storing it in a variable called prompts. And that means we have access to using that package in our own code. So what we're going to do is we're going to say const prompts equals require, require e apparently, require prompts. So I go down to my terminal, and I type in node index.js, and it does nothing. OK, well, that's fine. All we did is basically say, OK, pull this package in, but we haven't given it any commands yet. We haven't told it what to do with the prompts package. We just told it that our code needs access to that prompts package. Hey, could you explain what a prompt is again, please? Because honestly, I'm not even getting it. Yeah, so a prompt is, is what we are going to um, how we're going to get user input from the terminal. We're going to prompt the user, what number would you like to enter? And they're going to type in five and hit enter. And we're going to get that response from the user. So prompts is just an easier way to uh, prompt the user for some input. 
that we are going to use in our software later. Okay. Okay. Now, we are going to uh, use a more advanced concept here called asynchronous code. Asynchronous code is when we are waiting for the computer to either do something in the background or we're saying wait here before we move on to the next line of code. We need to tell the computer wait here for the user to actually input the number before we move on to the next line of code. So there's going to be some syntax in here that is going to look like a whole bunch of parentheses and curly braces that you have no idea what they're doing. This is really advanced JavaScript that unfortunately we need to get into in order for our prompts package to work. So don't worry about asynchronous. That's a term that will come back to you in week 16 or 17. For now, just follow along. We're going to do parentheses. We are going to do parentheses inside of that and an arrow function with some parentheses at the end. I know that looks really ugly. You guys don't have to understand that right now. All we're basically doing is setting up the computer for some asynchronous code. Oh, and let me start a live share for you guys. Um, If you would like to join the live share, I just put that in the live stream channel. It's parentheses and then an empty set of parentheses and then curly braces at the end of line three and the beginning of line five. That's as big as I can make it. Hmm. <laughs> I love that. It is also in the slides. So if it's easier to pull up the slides, um, it's on it's uh in slide three. Mm. Okay, we will know if you have this right or not in the next slide. Um, so uh, if you have any red squigglies somewhere, that means you probably do have something wrong. Uh, but we're looking for our parentheses and our uh, squigglies and everything at the right, the right spot. Okay, so we are going to write out some code to prompt our user to enter some information. Um, again, this is all in the slide. So if you want to reference that, I'm on slide four. Uh, if you want to have a version you can zoom in on or whatever, but I'm going to uh, try and do it all here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say const num1. Const is saying that number is not going to change. Once they enter that number, num1 for, will forever be whatever number they enter. Then we're going to say, what is num1 equal to? Remember, whatever is on the left side of the, the equal is where we're storing the information. Whatever is on the right side of the equal is what information we're going to store into that variable. Then we're going to use a keyword here called await. We are going to wait for the user to enter that variable. Now we need to give the computer information about what we are going to prompt them for. So we're going to pull in our prompts package, but prompts need some additional information. The information that it needs all comes from an object. Remember, an object is key value pairs. So I'm going to put my parentheses in there because we need to tell prompts the parameters or arguments that it needs to get the job done. And that argument is going to be an object. An object means curly braces. Now, because it's an object, we have key value pairs. So we're going to say the type of information we are prompting them for. Type goes on the left side here because it's the key. The colon goes between the key and the value. 
And this particular value is going to be a string called number. We are going to prompt the user for a number. And we are going to say the name of that number is going to be my num one. And then the message we are going to show the user is what number would you like to add first? So I'm going to pull this down a little bit. I'm going to make sure my file is saved. Don't worry, I'm going to take a break after this. I just want to show you guys what the output is. I'm going to type in node index.js, or I'm going to use my up enter shortcut. And I'm going to hit enter and look at what my terminal says. It says, what number would you like to enter or to add first? So I'm going to type in any number there and hit enter. And that's it. My program is done running. That's OK. We haven't told it to do anything with that number yet. All we did was tell the computer, hey, I am prompting you for a number. We are storing it in a variable called num1. And the message that we want to show up in the terminal is what number would you like to add first? It's a lot of concepts that we just covered in here. Those objects that we played around with yesterday, we're passing that object into the prompts package. That is requiring the type of the input, the name that we're going to store it into, and the message itself. It is creating a new object. Did you save your file before you ran it? Isona? Okay. You're going to need an NPM install prompts. Um, they always get me. Okay, they always get me. Yes, because it goes to that JSON to the my call. He's in the correct folder, but it was given him this. First. He copied and pasted. Should I just like re um, I don't like this space here. Cannot find. Well, but it's index.js, not playground.js. Ah. Oh, it didn't change. Yeah, you need to do index.js. Okay, great. Uh, so I, I typed in manually the node in index.js. I had the question mark first, and then I have a grid. Is that okay? That's normal. Yeah. yeah. That's normal. So that's if. Max has up there. if you, oh. You look like he had the question mark at the end. Did he get before he put that number five in? It looked like that's question. So if you put in five. Yeah, see how my question mark shows up? Uh, oh, no, you can enter any number and hit enter. Uh, yeah. Just us a prompt. Yep. All right, remote people, I see you. Bobby, you're up first. <clears throat> Some reason when I try to go do it in a terminal, it keeps saying uh, NPM install prompts. I don't know why it's like. I already did it, and then I'm trying to have like run this section of it, and it, it keeps saying that for some reason. Share your screen. Let's take a look. Um, okay, so you're good to go there. So all you need to do is click into your terminal and do a um, node space index.js.
and then hit enter on that. And now it's going to ask you, what number do you want to put in? So put any number in and hit enter. And you're good to go. You're all called up. Cool. Thank you. Jordan, you're up. Never mind. Goodbye. Okay. So we're going to keep going. All right. So we've got our number and it like took it, but it didn't do anything with it. So let's see what it's doing with it, right? We're going to come down here and we're going to do a console.log num1. Okay, I can't see that zoomed in. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, what I did, it's important where we put this, right? This is when our indentation matters. I'm not putting my console log out here on line 12. I'm making sure I'm right after my line 8. Right, I need that to be inside this async nasty syntax. Um, because I'm inside of that, I will have access to num1 here. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to come back down into my terminal. I'm going to hit up enter to rerun my code. And it says, what number would you like to add first? So I'll put in eight this time and hit enter. And look at what came out. What came out was an object. How do I know this is an object? The curly braces, how else do I know it is an object? It has a key on the left, the value on the right, and a colon in between. Okay, so that's an object. If we remember what we did yesterday, how do I get into that object? I can use my bracket notation and say my num1. So I come back down here, I rerun my node index.js. It says, what number would you like to add first? I type in another number and hit enter. And now look at what's coming out of my console log. It's just the number nine. So that's because I was able to kind of get into the my num one uh, key by using the num one object that came in through my prompts package. Accessing the whole object, and since you added the bracket notation, you were able to dot notation. Correct. This is a dot notation, not bracket notation. But yes. Num1, when we console log that without this dot my num1, what we got out was this object down here, right? And we knew it was an object because of the curly braces. So what we were able to do is say, well, I don't want this whole num1 object. I want the actual number that got entered. So I can use that my num1 key to get access to the value that got entered. Okay, so we're going to get a little bit more practice typing this syntax because in order to add something together, we need two numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to say const num2 equals await my prompts, and I'm going to create another new object. It's still going to have a type of number. Yes, you could be lazy and copy and paste all of this, but where would the fun be in that of getting practice typing out all of this syntax?
Okay, so we come in here, we do our no, anyone need help? Well, was anything supposed to come up yet? What's that? Was anything supposed to come up yet? No, so when we go back down to our terminal, we'll hit up, enter again. Mm -hmm. And what it's gonna do is it says, what number do you wanna add first? Okay, mm -hmm. that's this code right here, right? Mm -hmm. So we type in a number and we hit enter. And it says second number, please. Okay, that's coming up here. So I enter my second number and I hit enter and I get one. Okay, well, that's fine. We didn't tell the computer to do anything. We just told it to console log out num1.myNum1. We need it to actually tell it to add those numbers together. So we're going to say your sum is and then we're going to say num1 plus my num1 dot my num1 plus num2 dot my num2. Um, yep. Um, under, the, um, under the second num2, the second number is still following the Miss Nakama. So I'll just show you the output of this. We can do four and seven and hit enter and get your sum is 11. Taking a breathing moment here to let everyone catch up. If you need help remotely, just raise your hand. If you need help in person, just raise your hand. You get better at it, trust me. That was one of my favorite student questions I've ever gotten was, do you actually type code that fast or like, is this pre-recorded? <laughs> like, oh, how honored. You think I'm a robot? <laughs> Tomorrow's uh, meeting, I'll have the speakerphone working, so you'll actually be able to hear them, and they'll be able to hear you, so it won't just be my mic. Cool. And you guys can run this program multiple times if you want, right? So hit up, enter again, play around with it, enter in different numbers, see, see what's happening. Okay, so let's take a moment here. Anyone remotely need help? Yes, please. Yes? Yes, please, yeah. Go ahead, share the screen. Okay. So I'm missing something because when I ran it down here, nothing happened. And I'm not finding where. Um, let me request remote control. Uh, we're going to do. I don't think you re-ran it. I think after you change this line of code, you forgot mm -hmm. to rerun it down here. What, what, what was weird is that I, do I always have to hit node index.js to rerun it? Yes. Okay, so I can just count on the arrow and the enter. Okay. Well, okay. if you go up, that's gonna rerun it. You just need to make sure this file up here is saved 
and then once it's saved and you run it, then you'll get the latest version of it. And okay. so now if you do two different numbers, you should get your expected output. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Anyone else need help? Okay. So we are actually going to move back to our slides here. So that's a prompts package. Actually, before we move back to the slides, let's talk through this. What's all of this code doing? Because, okay, it, it, it's running, it's doing what we expect, but the final step of understanding is not just getting our code working, right? It's always making sure that we understand how our code is working. What is the visual flow of all of this? Require means we're going to NPM to require in a package that we need. That package name is called prompts. Prompts is getting stored into this variable we call prompts. Now this async code, don't really worry about that. The computer is just being told, hey, we, got, we have to wait for the user to do something. So what we do is we come down here and the computer doesn't care about the const or the num1 or even the await, it says prompts. Where is prompts coming from? That's coming down from the prompts that we required in. Now, what information does the prompts need to use? That's what's coming between the first parenthesis and the closing parenthesis right here. All of that information is stored in an object. We know it's an object because of those curly braces. Now, because it's an object, we have key value pairs. There are three keys in this object, type, name, and message. And there are three values for those keys in this object that all happen to be strings. We put a comma at the end of every key value pair to know that another key value pair is coming. Now, the prompts package waits for the user to input that number and once it does, it stores that information in a variable called num1. That variable happens to be an object. So we repeat that same process down here. And then when we get our num1, it's like, what's num1? Num1 is coming out from here. And we're using this dot notation here to get access to my num1 to get the actual number out. We do the same thing for our num2. Our num2 is coming right from here based off of all of the information that is coming out of the prompts package. We then add those two numbers together, then concatenate our your sum is here, and finally console log that out to our console. So all of our output from right here is showing up right down here. Yes, I am well aware of how crazy those lines look. However, if you followed through the explanation of the order that the computer is reading this and executing it, you're able to say, hey, I understand what this JavaScript is doing. Then go a step deeper and say, do I understand this syntax? Do I understand the curly brace is for an object? Because it's for an object, I can use this dot notation down here to actually get access to the object, which is getting stored in the variable, which is coming from the prompts. That's the level that we want to work our way up to. The only two exceptions that I have for this, if you don't understand it, are what are these parentheses doing yet? We haven't really covered that of, OK, we're using parameters, but we don't really know what a function is. Um, and all of this async stuff. It makes me angry that you have to use that in order to get this code to work. So don't worry about any of the async. Uh, all of line three and all of line 17, you can just ignore. You don't really need to understand those quite yet. Okay. Any, uh, Jennifer, do you have a question? I do. Um, thank you. So I just want to understand that my num one is the number that the user is going to be typing in. Is yeah. So it's a little confusing because um, prompts returns back an object. It doesn't return back just the number. So the object that it is returning back gets stored in num1 here. And then the key inside of that object 
is going to be my num one right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. The value that they actually type in is going to be when we combine num one with my num one, which is what we are doing here. This mm -hmm. num one lines up with this num one, and this my num one lines up with the key we provided right here. So that means if we combine those two out, when we actually do this down here, we're going to get the value of whatever was in, uh, inputted, like the number two. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's starting to click a little. Thank you. I guess I'm a little confused. All right, because so using the dot notation and the log at the bottom. Yep. Right? So number one is the object, right? Yep. And in this case, my number one would be the key inside the object of num1. The object that we created, the key, there is no key that says my num1. It uses the name. So it's just like, it just pairs, like, you know what I'm saying? Like that would, that's kind of a little abstract. It, it is. And so that is a great segue into Max. How do you know that it needs to type in a name and a message, right? Like where did all, all of those come from. Like if we just called that, you know, prompt, would it know, you know, would it know to output it? The way that I know how to do all of this, because this is way beyond syntax, this is way beyond basic JavaScript, is if I go to back to NPM, and I, one of my favorite things is they have a long list of all the things NPM could stand for. So every time you refresh the page, you mm -hmm. get neutral port motel, or if you refresh it again, you get, oh, maybe it changes every day. So it's a little fun NPM Easter egg for you. But I'm going to go to the prompts package here and search, and every package has documentation with it. So they're going to give you a breakdown of like what, what this package can accomplish. But if you keep going down, you can see the breakdown of how to use this code. So here it has the message, the name, and the type. And then if we take this response, we can console log out the response and see what the output is here. It is an object with this value. Where did the value came from? That value was based off of the name we put into the prompts. I think that NPM changed if you scroll back up. The Easter egg you're talking about? Yes, now we get never more a poet's mantra. This will sink in more, don't worry. This is a lot for right now. But we just created our first program where we asked the user for some input, added two things together, and then gave them some output. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do that with this code in here. We needed to tell the computer what we were asking them for, a number. We needed to tell the computer where to store that using the name. We needed to tell the, the computer what to prompt the user for. We needed to tell the computer to wait for the user to finish entering that information before it moved on. We needed a place for the computer to store all of that information. And then we needed to tell the computer, hey, add those two numbers together and display this output. Okay, so when we're writing a program, a website, whatever, we have index.html, we've got CSS, and then we have- Now JavaScript. So those yep. could be in all one folder. All one folder is fine, yes. So then- When we get to back end, however, we will need more than one folder. But for right now, yes, all one folder is, is totally fine. So this is telling our HTML how to run. We haven't touched HTML yet. We'll get to that next week. No. This is right now we're just focusing on JavaScript and we're using Node to run our JavaScript. 
next week we'll level up a little bit and instead of telling node to run our javascript we'll put our javascript into our html in a similar manner that we put our CSS into our HTML, which will tell the browser what to do in our JavaScript to impact our HTML. Okay, yeah, that's what I meant to ask. Thank you. Yeah, I was also wondering how the heck we're gonna go from JavaScript to like putting HTML and CSS working into it. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that part. Mm -hmm. We're working our way up to that. Okay, so. We've got our everything running. We've got a, oh no, we only have 10 minutes of class left. So we are going to go back to our terms um, and capture some of this. And then I will update the slides and the outline for tomorrow to make sure we capture the rest of what we need to. So for terms tonight, what did we learn? Prompt. What did, what is prompt? User for some input in the terminal. Uh, it is an NPM package. We learned a wait. A wait. I'm going to put a sync here as well. Tells the computer to wait for the code to be done running before moving on to the next line. What's that? Um, asynchronous code. I'll separate this out. Um, runs in the background unless you specifically tell the computer to wait a wait on that line. I don't know. I want to do it. Key and uh, the information uh, stored uh, in an object to provide context about the value. And the value is um, opposite of the key stores the information labeled in the key. Require uh, JavaScript reserved word. And when I say reserved word, I mean like a word that's built into the operating system, right? Or built into the language itself, right? So we saw curly braces and, and parentheses. Those are all syntax, but there are also words that we are using that the the um, that JavaScript knows, right? What's an, another example of a reserved word that we've used already? Const. Um, so JavaScript reserved word uh, used to import packages that are installed via NPM. Console.log, um, a way to output uh, our code um, to see what the computer is doing as it processes it. This is going to be fun at the end of the program when we go through and have like 14 console.log definitions and they're like they're all going to be somewhat right. Object. Object. A way to store key value pairs uses uh, curly braces. So key value pairs are data types? No, an object is the data type the way the data type operates is using key value pairs. The value of a key value pair can be any data type. Okay. <laughs> so in other words, if we create, my mom calls it the saturation point. She's like, nothing more is going to get in here. I'm done. I'm tapped out. So if you have an object here, um, we can say like key one, and then make that like ABC. And then we can say something like key two uh, and make that a number. And then we could say something like key three and make it a Boolean. And that's all valid object. 
So the keys are always going to be a string. In other words, they're always going to be letters and numbers. Um, but the data type of the value can be anything. So the data type of OBJ is an object. The data type of OBJ.key1 is a string. The data type of OBJ.key2 is a number. And a key, if I'm not mistaken, a key could even be an object, right? Like the, the value could be. No, keys always have to be strings. Okay. No, I'm not talking about, I mean, the value of the key can be like a, another, like an object or a function of one. Um, and if you wanted to, you could get really fancy and get deep into a race. We'll save that for the API module. <laughs> <laughs> if only you had a long list of resources that you could go through. <laughs> Welcome to a boot camp, baby. <laughs> All right. Any other keys for tonight? Any other terms? I can, um, I'll send out another survey. Um, I will also say that I can do uh, office hours in person on Sunday. Uh, that will be at the Erie 21 house, which is right across from the parking lot at the computer lab. Um, so if you guys wanna do in person um, for office hours, there'll be Sunday at five. Um, I can totally do that. And then if you wanna stick around also and do like a study group and kick me out, you're welcome to stay in that area. Um, it is, it's called the Erie 21 house because it's literally the old alumni house. Um, and so it's like a living room hangout feeling, but still on campus. Um, so if you guys want to take advantage of that after office hours, that's totally fine. Um, and if there is another time that works for you guys for office hours, I can probably shift around when they are. So if you want to like talk amongst yourselves and then be like, hey, Max, can you do this time instead? Um, that's also totally fine. I just need to be there to let you in, but then I don't need to kick you out when I leave. Anything else, remote gallery, anyone uh, for terms that we need to capture for tonight? Mm -mm. Okay, I will see you guys all tomorrow. Uh, if you are coming in person, reminder, we are back at the library lab. We are not in this building. We are in the library uh, where we were for the first week of class. And then Thursday is open hack. If you are going and have not RSVP'd, please RSVP to that. And if we're not going, do, can we just work on the homework? Uh, during open hack, mm -hmm. or if you're if you can attend, yes, uh, okay. definitely work on homework. Um, and I lied. I said I was going to let you guys ask questions about homework at the beginning of class. We will start there after stand up tomorrow. Okay. Okay. I'll see you guys. Good night, Max. Thank you.